Carbon credits, or carbon offsets, are typically mentioned like they're all one synonymous product. But in reality, there are a variety of different CO2 emission reduction projects that have a positive impact on the environment. In this video, we're going to cover all the carbon project methodologies created by the big three carbon registries, VERA, Gold Standard, and the American Carbon Registry. So we're going to cover at least most of the possible carbon projects that you'll see in the voluntary carbon markets. Now, carbon projects can be broadly separated into two categories. Nature-based, which relates to project types, aka methodologies, that involve animals or plants. And then the other category is technology-based, which refers to industrial processes or the implementation of a variety of technologies. Now, within these groupings, the project types will either be avoiding the release of emissions or removing emissions from the atmosphere entirely. And we'll call those either avoidance or reduction projects. While carbon credits as a term can end up being used interchangeably at times, a project that avoids emitting more CO2 creates carbon credits, and a project that actually sequesters that CO2 and takes it out of the air creates carbon offsets. So that's a difference to be aware of. With that explanation out of the way, now we'll review a list of the possible approved methodologies used by different projects in the voluntary carbon markets right now. We'll start with the possible nature-based methodologies. One of the most popular project types being reforestation and deforestation. And this includes the controversial Red Plus framework, which stands for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation in developing countries. These projects are either trying to repopulate a previously deforested area or protect areas that are at risk of logging. And there are a variety of methodologies outlining how various aspects of this process should be conducted from rehabbing previously deforested areas so that there's a larger forest density with the trees closer together. You know, there's multiple methodologies about improved forest management, unplanned deforestation, avoiding ecosystem conversion. You know, forest restoration and preservation is one of the most prevalent types of projects out there right now. And this process doesn't just apply to trees on land either. Mangrove forests are one of the project types that generate what people like to call blue carbon offsets that have been quite popular recently as well. The difference is, mangroves grow in the water around the coastal areas of certain regions across the globe. And mangroves aren't the only projects that can generate these more water-based offsets either. There are also methodologies for the creation and restoration of wetlands and seagrass, benefiting the environment by sequestering carbon through increased biomass and within the soil itself. Other types of protected areas will be grasslands and peatlands or peat swamps. In fact, one of the largest carbon projects in the voluntary carbon markets is Carbon Streaming Corp's project in Indonesia called Remboraya, which is a peat swamp forest that would have been converted into palm oil plantations if it wasn't being protected through the carbon markets. And it's worth noting that all the methodologies that we just covered for creating carbon offsets are projects that sequester and actually remove carbon out of the atmosphere. Because of these trees are other types of plants intaking carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. That's one of the main reasons nature-based carbon offsets tend to trade at a premium to other types of carbon credits. Moving on, another type of methodology you'll see is related to improved tilling or fertilizer utilization for modern farming practices. Conventional tilling methods cause a significant level of soil disturbance, meaning loss of soil organic matter uh, disruption of microbes or other organisms within the soil, and soil erosion. There can be large quantities of carbon dioxide stored within the soil that, you know, if disturbed, leads to higher levels of greenhouse gas emissions. Another way of reducing emissions in farming is by optimizing the usage of fertilizer, because in many cases farmers can be over-applying fertilizer, and that can lead to more emissions from nitrogen oxide, which is up to 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So any reduction in these types of emissions is even more vital, so there's a methodology for that as well. Last but not least for the nature-based project types is the reduction of methane emissions due to changing the feed for livestock. There's a lot of noise about how factory farming is evil and creating a significant level of emissions, and we know that cows and other livestock emit a large amount of methane. So by changing their diet, you can help reduce their emissions. You know, either by using algae or other alternative food sources. But moving on to the technology-based methodologies, 
First up is the emissions reduction measures in the refrigerant space. Now, a huge problem has been the use of hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, for cooling and refrigeration. HFCs can be up to a thousand times as pollutant as CO2. So one pound of HFCs has the same heat trapping power as a thousand tons of CO2. Well better for the environment because they don't deplete the ozone layer like the other chemicals that were used previously, they still aren't ideal. So detecting and preventing the leakage of HFCs or recovering HCFCs and other ozone depleting substances can produce carbon credits since most of these operations will be reducing emissions rather than removing them. Another project type is utilized by a pretty popular company in the carbon markets, that would be Carbon Cure, who worked on developing a methodology to inject CO2 into concrete to sequester it out of the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide is permanently embedded in the concrete during this process, so this is a removal type of project. In a similar nature, the use of sulfur in concrete production can reduce emissions as well as it can replace more fossil fuel intensive alternatives to some extent, so that's another possible project there. Next up is reducing the energy consumption in buildings, whether that be residential or industrial. And this can be done through improved insulation or cooling components, more energy efficient waste disposal, or replacing light bulbs and shower heads. Moving on, as everyone knows, coal mining has been a major issue for the climate and in particular, Vera and other carbon registries will provide carbon credits to companies capturing methane emissions from both operating or retired coal mines. There are gas interception systems that can capture that methane to either destroy it with gas flaring or use it for power and heating. Next up is building EV charging stations. Now given the unprofitability of the EV charging network right now, there's a possibility of netting some carbon credits to help build out these charging stations because you're helping to displace fossil fuel usage through electric vehicles when doing so. Another way of displacing carbon emissions is through the incentivization of recoating the whole paint of shipping vessels or using other energy saving measures in the shipping space. Increasing the hydrodynamic nature of a ship through replacing the paint of its hull or installing new technology to make it move faster. By moving faster, the vessel will burn through fewer fossil fuels, so doing this can net you carbon credits if verified. New methodology that was recently released is the plugging of orphaned oil and gas wells, ones that have been abandoned or improperly sealed by the previous operator. These wells can leak significant levels of methane, which as discussed earlier, can be significantly more polluting than CO2 itself. So that will be an interesting methodology to watch as it progresses. Next up is the pretty popular methodology, the production and distribution of high efficiency cook stoves in developing regions. These cook stoves reduce carbon emissions because they can help limit the levels of wood usage or other more carbon intensive fuels in the area. And last but not least, we have carbon capture and storage or CCS, which is one of the technologies that actually generate carbon offsets as it sequesters CO2 out of the air. Problem being, many of the forms of CCS that currently exist are both capital intensive to build and energy intensive to operate. Now let's talk about the economics of these projects a bit more as well. Now talking about the economics of every type of project could be a whole other video on its own, so we can go over some of the general trends here instead. Generally speaking, many of the nature based projects are not nearly as capital intensive as some of the technological projects. Direct air capture being the worst because it's incredibly costly right now, you know, costing up to $300 per ton or more as of the making of this video. But as you can imagine, on the inverse of that, protecting an already existing forest is not particularly capital intensive. Once you have a general estimate of how much carbon is being sequestered, you know, file the various paperwork, there isn't much to do after the project is up and running. So the natural curve is many of these nature-based projects being cheaper overall. As you move further up the scale of technological and industrial advancement, things get more expensive. It's a large generalization, but it makes sense you know, why that's the average trend. Before we end the video, it's worth noting that there are many potential project types being tested and designed by the carbon registries. These were just most of the methodologies that have already been accepted. And with that said, thanks for watching.